<laughs> That's pretty proggy. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's got some more proggy shit in, in the middle of it. Cool. Yeah, let's um, do We want to do like one, maybe one more thing. Maybe do it. Welcome back to Lockhorns Banger TV's live weekly metal debate show straight from the Banger Bar. If you haven't subscribed already, please do so to Banger TV and push us over the 100,000 mark. For those of you watching in the live stream, thank you for your patience. A few technical difficulties, but really it's a prog metal episode. I just let it go. And so it's with the spirit of the episode. This week we are doing the top 10 essential prog metal albums of all time. It's going to get really nerdy this week, people. And to help me nerd out on this topic is Dylan Gowan. How are you, buddy? Hey, how you doing? <laughs> we're doing this all again. Uh, Dylan, of course, is drummer <laughs> of a uh, local Toronto band, Vesperia. Check them out. Uh, what have you been up to? Uh, I've just been busy. Uh, I've been working with Vesperia, you know, Howl's Die and Cardinal Street. All three bands have albums coming out this year. So we've been kind of preparing for the touring cycle for all three releases and then also working with a band in London called Blood Moon Collective, really wicked prog band. Yep. And uh, yeah, and then juggling school and, and work and doing other session work, so. The busy get busier, and yeah. as I always <laughs> like to say, the dr drummers in metal are, are the most valuable yet most uh, underrated, I think, uh, tools in the toolkit of metal, <laughs> so good job. Uh, let's get into prog metal a bit here. Uh, tell me how you got into this particular style of metal. Well, I really grew up in a very musical family, right? And, um, you know, my dad being a professional keyboard player, he eventually found himself into one of the uh, prog bands you have on your chart right now. <laughs> so, um, and then he was introducing me to all these different kinds of style of music, but then, like, Yes and Genesis and uh, King Crimson, and then eventually, as you get older, you kind of develop your, your, own, uh, your own style of music that you like. So yep. I started getting into bands like uh, System of a Down and Deftones, and then eventually, when I go to high school, somebody sees me with a Deftone shirt and says, hey, you should really listen to this band, and that band was Opeth. Right. He hands me a copy of My Arms Rehearse, and then it blew up from there, essentially, and it was, you know, I just got enthralled with the, the genre, just yeah. really getting, like, loving Gojira and right. Symphony X and Cynic, yeah. you know, all these great, you know, very cool. Perfect. Well, Perfect. the beginning of the end for most of us is high school. Oh, so, yeah. And good job, Dad. Way to go. Uh, important part of the story here. Uh, as you know, if you've been with us before, it's not just about us. It's about the conversation. We're here to dig deep into prog metal, and we want to hear your opinions on not just the most important prog metal bands, but actual albums that have shaped the trajectory, the evolution of this style of metal. And I want to give a shout out to everyone that's joining us uh, for the show today. We've got people from Belgium, Austria, Finland, Hungary, Sweden, Portugal, Lithuania, Poland, Argentina, Peru, Venezuela, Iraq, and our friends in the US in California, Texas, New Jersey, New York, Florida, Pennsylvania, Oregon, Las Vegas. And we got some Canadians, of course, uh, joining us from Edmonton, Saskatoon, and from across uh, Ontario. Speaking of fans, we got something a little bit different uh, this week, and I think just gives some indication as to the level of devotion and commitment to this particular style of metal. Nick Ottoviano is a regular participant here on Lockhorns, and prior to the episode, he went as far to create his own prog metal family tree. Oh, there wow. we go. We got some Queensryche, we got Meshuggah, Opeth, Rush, Mastodon, uh, Dream Theater, Tool, and we got some Between the Buried and Me, I think, uh, Cynic, and uh, some Dillinger, I think, in there mm -hmm. as well. So uh, thank you, uh, Nick for that contribution <laughs> is definitely a first and congratulations and also joining us not just on the internet live here in the studio is Lisa Latasur. Hello Lisa. 
Happy to be here. Happy it's up and running. It, we're, we're, <laughs> we're doing it. It's live television. And of course, Lisa is equipped with the most powerful instrument in the universe, and that is the cowbell from hell. And when we hear that sound, we are overdue to shut up. Anyway, okay, let's get into the conversation a bit here, um, uh, Dylan. Uh, leading up to the show, there's a lot of talk about what is prog rock and what is prog metal. And I think perhaps more than any other subgenre on the family tree, this is, this, this is a unique debate. Yeah. So let's get into that. What are the dividing lines for you? Well, because it, it's always difficult to kind of categorize between progressive rock and progressive metal because you're dealing with more of a, of a concept versus like a distinct sound, really. Right. But what I think of progressive metal, it's really just pretty much sounds like what it is. It's metal's take on progressive rock. Right. And, uh, you know, normally what kind of separates the two is just essentially just the, uh, the musicianship between metal and, and rock, where mm -hmm. rock kind of lays it back a little bit and it's still very technical, but not in a sense where it's like uh, an over, like a over veracity in sure. terms. Of, and then also speed is a big thing. Yeah. And, you know, also more technically, uh, arguably some could say it's more technically right. challenging. Right. So I would actually yeah. add production to the mix. And too. that's true as well. The production yeah, yeah. value, obviously to state the obvious metal has a far more metallic yeah, yeah. production <laughs> value for lack of that for expertise right there. Yeah. Uh, but uh, I think that that's a key difference here when we start to, and we'll get into this, that transition from what we would call prog rock to prog metal mm -hmm. is obviously uh, uh, the actual sonics of the album, I think, make a difference. Too. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. Absolutely. Okay. Um, well, here we go. What are we going to do next? Well, this is what we're going to do. We're going to pick the legend. Correct, Lisa? Right. So if you joined us for Essential Albums Power Metal or Essential Albums Doom, you know what we're trying to do here is narrow this down to 10. And a lot of it is up for debate, but one album is not up for debate, and it's the one that Sam and our guest have selected as the legend. So we start there. What's the legend in your opinion, Dylan? You know, it's the legend in my opinion. I've also seen like guys on the on the chat say it would, you know, 2112 was being the big one, but in my opinion, I really think that it was Queen's uh, Operation Mind Crime was right. was the start of uh -huh. the of the progression of <laughs> no pun intended of progressive metal. Yeah. yeah, so tell me a bit about this record. What in your opinion established this as the legendary prog yeah. metal album. Well, what I think is like super vital about Queensryche is that it, you know, it brought in the technicality of, of metal music and then it also brings like the concept element as well. But not only that, it kind of took uh, elements that were really kind of big in the, in the early 80s, kind of like expanding what I guess you could say like the proto metal bands were doing, right? Sure. Where, where it was like uh, Watchtower, Crimson Glory, and, um, mm. and maybe a little bit of what Rush was doing as mm. well. But then these guys kind of took it into a direction that was more or less like, this is progressive metal. Right. It, so that, I think that one was the most distinct one. Out and of, again, not to belabor yeah. the point, but they brought that real metallic sound. Of course, yeah. Uh, was applied, you know, some of the guitar tones, some of the riffing style, certainly drum production. I'm remembering on that record, a lot of that was just that those production sonics applied applied to prog rock, yeah, yeah. <laughs> which had long preceded uh, Queensryche. Well, it so turns out, for those of you who don't know, that uh, a few years ago we did a, uh, an episode uh, uh, for our series Metal Evolution specifically on uh, prog metal, and here we're going to go to a little clip where we dug into uh, Operation Mindcrime. What they were was a very traditional metal band who uh, sort of became progressive in, in the same way that Rush did. And, and they really had some visionary kind of ideas that made them stand out so much from the rest of the metal pack. They were certainly a bit of an intelligentsia leader in that, in that sense. I mean, let's remember, Queensryche's early stuff was still was very, very heavy. I mean, it was only when they went con really conceptual with Operation Mindcrime that made, went from being like just another American metal band to like, wow they've done something quite pivotal here. The thrust of the exercise really was to create a concept record, you know, one that was modeled after what had come before, you know, The Wall, Tommy, Quadrophenia, taking those albums as models and kind of giving it our twist, you know. Yeah. 
Well, there you go. Jeff Tate and others weighing in on this record, so maybe no surprise. I mean, definitely for yeah. Metal Evolution, we thought this was a pivotal record. But yeah. let's go to the board and see what everyone has to say about Operation Mindcrime. Here we go. Michael Cornett, Queensryche. Operation Mindcrime is prog metal to the core. It was pushing the boundaries of music before most bands even existed in the genre. Transgirl with Attitude says that Operation Mindcrime really put prog metal on the map. It's a great emotional album that tells mm -hmm. a great story. It's important, the idea yeah. of a narrative or a theme, a uh, concept running through the record, and it's a wonderful record. Mm -hmm. uh, Nick Ottaviano, yes, the creator <laughs> of his very own <laughs> prog metal chart, says Operation Mindcrime was one of the first progressive metal records to feature a cohesive storyline. There we go. And that wrapped throughout the record and have different ly lyrical themes and melodies intertwined and interconnected. So many prog bands have borrowed this idea uh, from Dream Theater scenes from a memory to between the buried and me's parallax uh, duo. So, and then we've got Jamie Laszlo says during the 80s, radio was filled with cheesy glam metal acts. Ah, oh, pause and remember, <laughs> for better or for worse, but somehow through all the murk of hairspray and makeup, Queensryche was able to make a statement with Operation Mindcrime. Along with its complex story and music, it also had great hooks. It's true, it's a catchy record. Mm -hmm. um, these hooks were able to give it radio play next to the likes of Winger and Warrant, Ooh. and in turn <laughs> giving progressive metal new life. I feel that without this album, there would be no Dream Theater, Opeth, or Porcupine Tree. Well mm. put. Rob Naylor says, if Operation Mindcrime, Mindcrime by Queensryche <laughs> is not at the top of the list, then this list is invalid. The perfect mix of proggy technicality, great songwriting, and melodic hardcore sensibilities of the time. You've got yeah. a lot of friends in internet land. I was kind of worried though, because like, I understand a lot of people were kind of mentioning 2112, and believe me, I love that record. Don't get me wrong, and I'm a big Rush fan. But when I consider Rush, I really think that they are definitely an influence on a lot of, I guess you could say, like bands that follow Queensryche to doing the progressive metal sure. thing. But it's kind of like I find I kind of put in the space where it's like with like Crimson Glory or Watchtower, where they're yep. kind of like you could see that there was something brewing, but then it wasn't until Queensryche yep. said like this, and when they put out Mindcrime, they said like this is progressive this is metal. It. We'll yeah. put a pin in Rush. We're getting to Rush. Hold your horses, people. They're gonna <laughs> come up. Uh, but before we get there, what we also like to do uh, on Lockhorns is give our guest their guest choice, a band that in your opinion, uh, or in this case an album that in your opinion uh, has to be here, uh, what's that record for you? Well, you know, it's funny, I, I thought about it a lot and I was almost reluctant to pick my favorite album because I can see already in the chat and I saw a lot of them on uh, uh, like Facebook comments saying yep. like, I already know there's going to be so much support for that album, so that album is going to automatically be there. But in terms of the, t of the timeline, I really think that um, Focus by Cynic mm -hmm. is a, absolute vital to the progression of of progressive metal, no pun intended. <laughs> and but like here's the thing, Sean and Paul, like super influential musicians. I mean, uh, you know, an album that was light years ahead of its time. Yep. And and then basically the overwhelming fan demand that they had to reform in 2006 because fans like loved it and it was such a hidden gem among prog fans. Yep. And of course. Also, they're doing the do vocalist thing. So they had bands, uh, so they were doing the clean singing and then the growling and then also including, you know, a little bit of jazz and a little bit of death metal. Right. And then, you know, of course, with them being in, uh, in death at the time, oh. uh, well, a little bit after, a little bit after, uh, after that, yeah. 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 Then, um, you know, of course, they're bringing that influence into the mix. And then, you know, it's just one of those albums where it's just like, it really took its turn where it went from this kind of like super technica, uh, technical aspect yep. into then a much darker aesthetic. Yep. Well, it's yeah. quite often that you find albums that uh, maybe don't get appreciated quite as much as they should at the time. Mm -hmm. But as years pass, people realize that, holy fuck, where did this all come from? Well, yeah. it came from here. On the board, we got some support for Cynic out here. I think we do. We got JL Troxel 278. Cynic's focus definitely should be up there too. The jazz fusion death metal thing was mind blowing. Masterful, masterful drums. I mean, that expression jazz fusion death metal probably yeah. didn't exist at the time. These guys basically created that possibility. Thrash Maniac 99, Cynic's focus is an underrated classic 
to the genre it combines death metal with jazz and has the prog sensibility. Diz Chew Focus is an amazing album. <laughs> uh, Delicious Dishes, we don't have modern progressive without this masterpiece that wowed everyone back in 93. Newer bands like Obscura, that's a good point. Yeah. They're a chip off that block for sure. Uh, for example, Wouldn't Exist Without Focus, Sounds of Perseverance, there we go, finally. <laughs> <laughs> uh, was making people mad more than inspiring them to do prog, I would say. Uh, Cynic, also hugely influential for that bass. Uh, if you hear a fretless and proggy metal, it's probably Cynic Worship. I'm not going to get into a death conversation. We'll have to resist that rap hole. <laughs> Nick Ottaviano, uh, Cynic, Focus. Oh my, what a record this is. I can only imagine what death metal fans were thinking when they heard the first minute of Veil of Maya. At first, it's heavy and has an undeniable death metal rhythm section, but is also jazzy elements, and even use use of a vo vocoded clean that is vocals, yeah, yeah. which even in this day isn't in an age as a big <laughs> no-no. Uh, yeah, Richie Sambora, hello. Uh, but Cynic did a good job with it. It's basically death metal for aliens. It really Maybe is. that's the quote so but, far, death metal for aliens. But Book it's market. puzzled, like, you know, for, coming from a, drummer, a drummer's perspective of it, Sean's like a super influential drummer, especially with progressive uh, metal, like like musicianship in yeah, a way. Absolutely. I mean, like when uh, in the chat saying like Veil of Mile, I mean like guys were still scratching their head. And then even when they played Vakken after they reformed, yeah. uh, you know, seeing, playing How Could I, like you could just see that the audience was just standing there just completely like, Floored. Floored with yeah. the amount of like musicianship. But yeah, Cynic, absolutely. If we we're talking about progressive metal, Cynic is an absolute must. I can feel the passion oozing off this guy. This guy's <laughs> a big fan of Cynic. Focus, people. I haven't missed them. Uh, I haven't missed them no since I, 2008. I don't think <laughs> that anyone is a, detra is a detractor on this one. Mm -hmm. You've got a lot of allies out there. Okay, Lisa. Are we going to There's broaden so the conversation? So what are we going to do? So much going on on the chat, and we're talking about Mastodon, and we're talking about and uh, a lot of really good prog, a lot of really good prog metal jokes. I would so add. So many oh, yeah. prog yeah. metal yeah. jokes. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, before we get to Tool and Rush and Mastodon, I think we need to go to Dream Theater. Dream Theater. Because mm -hmm. we're not sure which record. Okay. Oh, really? Well, yeah. wow. here we go. Let's see what people have to say. Guess what? Nick Ottaviano has a comment. <laughs> Dream Theater images and words. This was the first time that prog metal had really erupted into the mainstream at a very strange time in music, too. And I think this was the album that we actually focused primarily on mm -hmm. in the episode. At a time where grunge and the Black Album were all kids wanted, images and words comes out as a major success, even though it's full range of heavy riffs and eight minute songs. Okay, alternate choice. He's given us an alternate choice. I don't know if that should be allowed. But anyway, personally, I think Awake, the follow-up to Images and Words, is a better record. Hmm. It definitely ratcheted up the heaviness for metal, which kind of scared some people off. It was one of the first records to utilize a seven string, long before Meshuga, important that is point. That is and true. just before Korn released their debut. Not sure really how that figures. Doesn't matter. <laughs> uh, Chuck from Death also called the record a huge inspiration. Well, there you go. Rest in peace, Chuck. Uh, behind the symbolic and sound of perseverance, Records, okay, breathe. Delicious <laughs> dishes, a lot of words, it's prog. Images and words, this basically defines the regular prog metal we even hear today. S. Potter, I would argue that Images and Words is one of the most influential albums. Uh, Rush, Iron Maiden, Metallica had a kid and this was that product, not to mention <laughs> prog had disappeared at that time. Well, conveniently we have two magnets. There we so go. let's put them both up and we'll just maybe just bookend uh, Cynic uh, for, uh, for now. Tell me about Dream Theater and these albums. Dylan, what's your opinion? Well, obviously, it's like you cannot. You, it's like it's a, almost a <laughs> almost a crime not to not to mention Dream Theater, especially. Sure. That's like saying uh, not having new uh, not mentioning Iron Maiden in the new album scene, right, right? right? But in terms of like the influence that these bands had, especially with Metropolis Part Two, which is the uh, I think it's the record that uh, was Jordan Rudis' uh, debut. Okay, yeah, I think. Right. But then Images and Words was basically what put Dream Theater on on the map. Sure. Yeah. And especially with Pull Me Under, arguably their biggest song and uh, but you know it's weird though it's like in terms of both of their influences though I would almost argue that images and words was the bigger influence sure. but but you know it's, it's so hard though because it's like you like both it's like it, it's like there's never you know no such thing as having too much of a good thing, right? Yeah, it's hard to pick but, your favorites, but I do think important criteria we always talk about here, not to get too nerdy, well, yes, it is prog metal, is that it is about influence. That's true. I think that's important. Mm -hmm. We can all dispute that maybe Metropolis 2 is a better record, etc., but you, if you really, we have to really boil it down to a record that had a lasting influence or perhaps mm -hmm. inspired bands yeah. to do something like this. 
we could probably argue images and words is the one. What do I, you think? I'd say images and words for okay. sure, hands okay. down. All yeah. right. Lisa. We're not sure. We're not sure. Really? Wow. Okay, well, it, con it continues. What do we got? We got GX Shepherd on Twitter says that I love images and words, but Metropolis uh, Part 2 is really where the boat was pushed out. Nice metaphor. Uh, it's a nautical prog metal uh, theme. Pushed the aesthetic even further. Probably still my favorite concept album. Probably a masterpiece. Shark Crusher 13 says images and words is the first album I think when I hear the word prog metal. It literally defines the modern prog metal, prog metal record and is still a big influence for many bands. Today, the uh, Abyssal Archivist says, go ahead and keep both albums in. Are you Canadian or Swiss? And uh, they deserve <laughs> to belong. So I feel like a lot of the chat is saying that they personally like Metropolis more. They think it's a better record, yeah. but the images is more influential. Fair enough. That's tough, man. Because like, because we like to be honest though, I always figured that it was like, if we're gonna pick either like one of those two, it's like you know, it's it's tough. I always went with images and words first before Metropolis Part Two, no. but. I, but you know what, if you want to keep both, we're Canadian, we'll be diplomatic. <laughs> it's the timeless tension between objective and subjective. Let's move on, so Let's shall move we? on to another debate, which is, what Mastodon album? Why okay. don't you guys Ooh. give me your picks? Well, here we go. All well, right. of course, we started with Mastodon at the top yep. of the show. That was a scene we shot for the prog metal episode when we were there in Atlanta, and they were recording uh, The Hunter. Yeah. Are we going to go to the board first and we get some license here, Lisa? Go ahead. Crack the Sky, I think, in my opinion, although a later record, certainly maybe not their best, certainly not the one that people started paying attention to in sort of a bigger, uh, with a bigger audience, but I would argue is by far their most proggy record no, so true. i don't know what do you think we're locking horns here i'm saying leviathan okay. <laughs> all right but like because like leviathan was like the was the album that really kind of really put their footnote into the prog world and i just yep. think that if if it had to be two if yep. it had to be up between like those two choices don't get me wrong i love crack the sky i yep. think it's great um especially if like have you seen them on uh, did you see them on letterman doing yes. uh yeah doing Oblivion. but like even with like Leviathan though, like they did the whole concept record yep. revolving around Moby Dick, and I just think, and I'm a little bit biased because Blood and Thunder is my favorite song by Mastodon. Sure, so. sure, sure. But you know, well, good job we got two <laughs> magnets here, people. Otherwise, it could get pretty bloody here on the prog metal set. So there we go. We've got uh, both Crack the Sky and Leviathan. Uh, crack the Sky. Anyway, let's see what the Leviathan. board has to say. <laughs> William Jenkins, uh, Mastodon Crack the Sky is an essential modern prog metal album. It captures what is best about prog, about metal, and Mastodon through the concept, composition, and time signatures. Mm -hmm. Well composed, William. And Tidor15 <laughs> says, Crack the Sky by Mastodon Pure Sledge, mixed with ethereal prog in a whole discography of greatness. Crack the Sky is the best. Visa Yerkinen says that Leviathan is a concept album. What's more prog than that? Ben UFO, <laughs> Leviathan 100%. Leonard Reibstein, uh, Blood Mountain. Crack is too prog. Uh, you can never be too prog. Certainly not on this episode. <laughs> Sorry, man. Uh, you can never be too prog. <laughs> uh, uh, I think that's a vote for Crack the Sky. But anyway, uh, Leviathan is too metal. Mountain splits the difference. Fair enough. Luca Hope Fallon. Crack the Sky definitely. It's operatic in tone. It involves... Uh, much more complex and technical musicianship plays around a lot more with the idea of music as soundscape. Is there a banjo on there? I can't remember. It's almost astral. I love that word. In a, in a way, uh, like a lot of spacey stuff in there, thematically, atmospherically. Hearts Alive is obviously a great proggy song, but Crap the Sky as a whole is just more sweeping, more complicated, more fundamentally progressive epic uh, that has so much King Crimson and Genesis and prog rock in there. Also more keyboards, I guess, uh, just always equals more prog, no? Uh, Blood Moon Collective. Ah. Uh, uh, where are we? I've lost you, Lisa. Whoa. I think... Uh, where are we? Uh, where'd he go? Blood Moon Collective. Where are you? There you are. Yeah. I think Crack the Sky is to scenes from a memory as Blood Mountain is to images and words. Crack the Sky is a better album, but Blood Mountain is more influential. I'm charging you more for this. Here we go. Uh, <laughs> Travis Gallagher, Leviathan was an all-out ride. From start to finish, it was unlike anything released at the time. Wouldn't dispute that for a moment. Uh, I love all the records, that's the problem. Mm -hmm. S13 Gaming, I'd say uh, Blood Mountain, it shows them uh, one foot in the past with Remission and Leviathan and one foot in the experimentation that would take them into the future. And this conversation would not be complete without a comment from 
Nick Ottoviano. <laughs> Consider the dawn dynamic of the music, uh, metal music scene when Leviathan came out. This is good. Yeah. New metal and early metalcore by the time Crack the Sky came out, other new young prog bands were everywhere. The whole Sumerian prog era was in full swing. Dream Theater were as popular as ever. Cynic had reformed. Devin Townsend disbanded. Strapping on Lad had done several DTP albums. Leviathan left much more of an impact for prog. Well, I don't, what, are your, what are your thoughts on all that? Well, I don't know if Devin Townsend necessarily disbanded. He was just kind of like reforming his own his own thing. That's a sidetrack. Oh, sorry. It's, it's Mastodon versus Mastodon I know. versus I'm sorry. Mastodon. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. But no, you I, got cowbell, dude. I know. <laughs> but no, on, but I, to be honest, like I'm still leaning towards Blend. Uh, you know, sorry. Sorry, Leviathan, because yeah. Blood and Thunder is my favorite song, so right. I'm a little bit biased on it. Yeah. But yeah, it is a little bit more metal than Crack the Sky. But at the same time, though, you kind of see that there was a little bit more of a, like people were hitching in the wagon to Mastodon sure. through. Uh, yeah, a bit of a different Leviathan, dispute no. here compared to Dream Theater. I think what we're getting into here is that it's actually one album is probably more influential. It made a bigger impact, yeah. which may mean it wins out in the end. Crack the Sky is a more proggy album. Yeah. I think we can't dispute that. So tough to tell. Dylan and I will try to continue yeah. to get along. It could be difficult. Lisa, what's next? Let's make this an easy one. Okay. Everyone seems to agree on Blackwater Park. And I know that you could talk about Opeth for 45 minutes, so let's try and keep it together. Yeah. yeah. But what do you think of that choice? Uh, Opeth, Blackwater Park. Well, Guess my, first. My favorite album of all time. Yep. That was the album that, like, I knew there was going to be so much support for it. I mean, you, like, Opeth, obviously my favorite band of all time. I mean, like, like you said, like, I literally could talk about for hours about how influential some of the drumming has been, especially with uh, Martin Axenrod and Martin Lopez, now with Soen. Yeah. But, like, Opeth's Blackwater Park was basically the key to, like, basically introducing a lot of the people to um, to the band. And especially the production with Steve Wilson yeah. kind of brought them into a, a different a different aspect of the, of the group. But I love how Opeth is one of those bands that can take you into, like, such anger and then almost, like, calms you down and then to a place of, like, like sadness. It's like, what do you, like, it's a, such an emotional roller coaster, Blackwater Park. It's outstanding record. My favorite record of all time. Uh, one of my favorite metal records of all time, too. No dispute there. Fantastic album. Uh, man, I listened to that album a fucking lot of times. Uh, yeah, so I think in terms of impact and influence, I don't think we can dispute that. I think it's a similar debate to Mastodon, though, just to play a bit of a devil, devil's advocate here. I think... I'm actually a huge fan of Ghost Reveries, uh, which 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 was later than Blackwater Park, of course, because mm -hmm. it leaned um, even further into a much more distinctly prog metal uh, direction. And then, of course, we get into subsequent albums like Damnation and and yeah. and, and, and and the rest of them. So. Let's go to the board. Fair enough. Uh, <laughs> I thought this was going to be easy, but apparently people agree with Sam on this before one. Before we uh, lose our breath, Jamie Laszlo. During the 90s, alternative rock was selling most and metal was on the back burner. But in 2001, Opeth was able to create a buzz with Blackwater Park. I think its biggest accomplishment with its hard to soft parts was to make people who wouldn't normally listen to extreme metal with death growls take notice. It's a great point. Mm -hmm. I was actually one of those people. Opeth opened uh, a door to me to other extreme metal acts, and I believe you can call them a gateway band. It's absolutely <laughs> true. Um, not sure Blackwater Park was as appreciated as the time, as Jamie is indicating. I think it took a bit of time for it to resonate. But at, but at the same time, someone can make the argument, though, that Cynic's focus wasn't as, as influential at the time, but you can just see that the longevity of the yeah. entire album yeah. was huge to those it's, fans. I mean, you put yeah. the record on now, it still sounds great. Mm -hmm. No dispute there. Delicious Dishes, you don't have modern prog death without Opeth. Fair. But yeah, what record? True. Delicious. Let's hear it. <laughs> Artur Philippe de Castan has back Blackwater Park. The magnum opus, uh, Phallus Day, Michael Ackerfeld is god of prog metal. Uh, it's like is. an axiom, <laughs> if you will. <laughs> Man like Grave Worm Opeth are so overrated. Well, you kind of you know that with a with a name like Grave Worm. I think we know where this is going. It pains me to say <laughs> they're incredibly influential to bands that do it better than them. Careful not to dismiss. Your forefathers, uh, man, like uh, the words, abyssal <laughs> argument. If you want to go for Blackwater Park, uh, it's like saying Masters of Reality is an overrated record. Uh, but Ghost Reveries is even proggier, in my opinion. I, I think that's true. I guess the question is, is it more influential? 
It's up for debate. Shark Crusher 13. I personally want Ghost Reveries instead, but Blackwater is the most influential record and the start uh, for their more progressive era, so it only makes sense to add. I'm actually surprised we haven't got like yeah. the Horde screaming for my arms, your hearse, still life. I mean, there's that yeah. whole pre-Blackwater Park catalog that people think are actually well, it, more proggy. Well, because people think that like the candlelight days with yeah. Opeth was like more of like, that was kind of their staple in terms of having it a more of an impact. Like yeah. some people argue that like it was Op like Opeth, like starting with Black Park Park and getting into like more of like arguably, I guess like commercialist angle, but I highly doubt, but like, but to be honest with you, it's like, you know, each band progresses into a, like a new kind of era, right? Yeah. Especially now with them kind of going back to going to a more of a prog uh, rock aesthetic, right? Yeah. But it, it, but it's like here's the thing though: if that album did not have its influence, then there would be no Ghost Reveries, right? So True I would enough. say, but and plus like with and that whole started the whole you know production with Steve Wilson and like mm -hmm. how that relationship came about and. You know, I just think that, you know, of course, once again, I'm biased because all my favorite songs from Opeth are from Blackwater Park, like, like uh, you know, Bleak and... Yep. Um, it's fantastic, yeah. uh, fantastic record. People need to check their head when they start to say that Opeth is a commercial band if you listen to the fucking radio. Anyway, we won't get <laughs> into that. Lisa, what's next? Have we got more Opeth? Are we moving on? I think we're moving on from okay. Opeth. Okay. Uh, this is a band that uh, is kind of unexpected. It wasn't on our list, but people want to talk about... Colors by Between mm. the Buried Me. I think it was on Nick Adriano's original chart. No maybe kidding. It'll, maybe it'll make it on our chart. What isn't also? on that chart? JL Troxel 278 says B, Between the Buried and Me. I'm just going to say it. Anyway, Colors is where every single prog metalcore band got their ideas. Colors mm -hmm. absolutely has to be up there. Seriously, 13 minute track about daydreaming on a plan. Heavy metal heretic Color Colors is <laughs> the best album of the last decade. Okay, well, we have a magnet for the band, not the album. Give me your thoughts on, on BT Bam. They're a great band. I've seen them several times. Yeah. Uh, first time I saw them was with uh, was when Cynic was opening for them. Um, but yeah, no, fantastic album, especially with Colors. Kind of started off with a little bit of like a piano intro, yeah. and then it just started to like get into this like freight train of like death metal and I guess like some hardcore elements. But these guys were kind of like almost the bridge between a lot of the metalcore fans yeah. and the prog metal fans. So then eventually you kind of get both fan bases loving one band. And I think that's also the appeal with a lot of these bands is that they take two audiences and then kind of bring them into the into the prog metal family. Yeah, I remember yeah. When, when that album came out, it it didn't sound like anything else no, at it was, the time. It's uh, his own except thing, yeah. that it reminded me a lot of Mr. Bungle, oh, which it, uh, is is a good thing. Well, they're a good thing. Like, well, of course, like with like Mr. Bungle was Mike Patton's thing, correct? Yeah, correct. yeah. So it's like you know that that term experimental was founded with like a lot of these bands, right? And and that's that's part of what progressive metal is is just basically experimenting and seeing what works, right? And basically, it's the only genre, arguably, arguably in the metal. Mm -hmm. tree that you can really get away with throwing a hoe down in a song right. and yeah. then still just jumping into this metal yeah. thing. They like, really stretched it out. They yeah. brought like a, almost a schizophrenia, a real eclecticism yeah. uh, to, to metal and I think in a way that hadn't done, been done before. Yeah. More that, from that the board? Was, oh. That was sweet. <laughs> Come on. That was sweet. It's a cowbell from hell, it's, no, it's, after all. It's terrible. Um, <laughs> that thing. Again, we thought this was going to be easy with colors, and then you threw the band name out there, and apparently there's another record. Under okay, contention. well, Abysmal mm. Archivist says, uh, between the Baron and me, same issue as with Opeth. Mm. Colors had the influence, but Parallax had the best quality. Yeah, I mean, there's some, it, it's like the... Yeah, it's like the album before the, the band really hits their stride, maybe. But mm -hmm. uh, Nick Draney, uh, I'd like to put a shout out for Between the Buried and Me's album Parallax 2's future sequence. Mm. It's relatively new in the grander scheme, but it really showcases what prog metal is all about. Very technical, very introspective, and most of all, it has a strong narrative theme. A good prog album should also make you feel like you have to listen from start to finish. It's a great point. It's about the album. Uh, you just can't jump on in on any track. Future Sequence has this. I will see. Yeah. I will say that uh, between the Barry and me, for the length of time they've been around, has been enormously influential. Oh yeah, we're hearing that sound in a lot of music. And uh, Monsieur Ottaviano's back. BT Bam says. Uh, colors absolutely changed uh, the game for underground heavier music. The fact that they did colors in the middle of a deathcore revolution and only got bigger says it all. That's true. I mean, but it, you can just tell that, you know, it's one of those bands that were like super experimenting with different genres, right? And of course, with like, 
you know, all these different bands that were coming out in the, or in the later, you know, like kind of like, sorry, I guess like mid 2000s, right? Yeah. Where it was the deathcore thing. Yeah. But this band kind of squeaked through with even that fan base and brought some of those kind of like hardcore-ish kids sure. into the fold. Sure, they had that sensibility and as then, well. And then you get the, like the eventual gent thing that I, comes from it. We won't go there. <laughs> we're not gonna go there. Uh, but yeah. <laughs> I think Important you, point, nothing, yeah. nothing like what came before. Exactly, yeah, yeah. Yes, Lisa. So I think you need to get out the magic pen and write down both records as contenders. Magic pen. We'll Touch it out at the end. Uh, we're going to go, we're going to go, we're going to go BT Bam, um, Colors, and, and is it uh, Parallax? I think it is. Yeah. But the one thing that's great, though, is that like no one's disputing that these bands belong, though, which is a good thing, though, because it's like, yeah, Between the Buried and Me is kind of more, is more influential, I guess, to like, yes, the next generation that's kind of coming up in the scene, yeah. as well with Queens, right, kind of like helping to kickstart it. And then <coughs> then all of these bands kind of come come around. Right. So for sure. So it's more or less now just about, I guess, <laughs> locking horns with just the albums, though. That's the only <laughs> well, thing. That's yeah. what we're here to do. <laughs> We get, need to get, get nerdier some... than ever. It's been nerdier, uh, Lisa. <laughs> we need to get some more bands on this chart. Yeah. I know because you know we've got a cluster here. Yeah. But first, a little side note that I cannot ignore because it keeps coming up. Thrash Maniac '99, Death Symbolic. <laughs> yes, uh, should be added because it's an influential prog metal album. Perfect balance of extremity and mel melody with prog structures attached. If Death doesn't make the list, that's a crime. Is this a prog metal album, though? I'd say, to be honest, no. I, I like, and I'm not meaning that in like a negative way. Symbolic's a really, really wicked album, especially with Paul and Sean being in group, and then yeah. Steve DiGiorgio, of course, holding the bass lines. Yeah. Um, but to be honest, though, like someone can make the argument that Chuck, if uh, if he was still around, would yeah. have kind of found his way into a band similar to Cynic, or maybe perhaps even make Death into kind of a Cynic aesthetic. But that's basically a what if scenario right yeah and it's it's really hard to tell though because you know especially with him and death it's like sound of perseverance was kind of like they're arguably death's most experimental sure. side of it yeah but i still think some like symbolic don't get me wrong great album i just think it's just a death metal album. i think it's still a death metal album we agree on that so we're gonna move on from death lisa what's next <laughs> up for debate Time for Tool. Time for Tool. <laughs> it's Tool time here on Lockhorns. It's Tool time. It's tool time. And in fact, in every episode of Lockhorns, it's Tool time. There may be a Tool yeah. only episode in the future. We should have a Tool yeah. for now. <laughs> 10 for Tool. 10 minutes on Tool. Uh, here we go. Joel Harold. No Tool? Seriously? Enema is amazing and could be regarded as their first progressive album with very complex concepts presented a company. Uh, Present, sorry, accompanied by epics like Uligi and Third Eye. Alejandro Ochoa says that Lateralist from Tool was the most influential prog album for the last two decades. Bold statement. I can argue that uh, not all the two albums are progressive rock, but this album is a cornerstone in the taste developed by the new listeners of prog music. On, in the other, on the other hand, oh, we get more love for colors <laughs> here. We've been there. Is the second most important about prog metal album than Lateralist was the template of prog metal. Colors was its consolidation. And Craig Mailman, <laughs> live from in the studio, uh, says Enema. A Carl Young concept album. He's smart, people. Get back Dedicated to work, Craig Mailman. Dedicated to Bill Hicks. <laughs> Enough said. Go back to making sure we're in sync. But anyway, yeah. uh, Anima, Michael Joseph says, I'm going to be the devil's advocate. I don't think Tool are metal. Lot to discuss here. Yeah. Sorry. What do you think? Just a quick side note. Yes. I mixed up Symbolic with Human. I apologize for the people in the chat. Sorry right. about that. Um, Holman was on Symbolic. Holman was yeah. on Symbolic. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Made a mistake. Sorry about that. Tool. They're absolutely a prog metal band. And mm -hmm. I really think that, to be honest with you. And uh, yeah, and they kind of brought like the grunge aesthetic with, with progressive metal. And plus, Danny Carey being a very experimental drummer kind of held the line in terms of a heavy rhythm section mm -hmm. and plus they drowned out with very long uh, very long songs sure. and you know even though tool's been like a topic of like are they prog metal or are they post metal or are they progressive grunge you know you're kind of doing things right in the prog metal branch if you're essentially your own sub sub genre sure. in a way but yeah i just think yeah tool is definitely a prog metal you hear a lot of tool in a lot of different bands that's true in metal and across yeah. multiple genres this is arguably the single most 
amorphous band, yeah. I think, on the entire family tree. Opeth comes up a lot, Devin Townsend comes up, but literally Tool comes up yeah. in almost every episode. Delicious Dishes adds, if it's Tool, then of course it's Lateralis, the progressed one, and the title track is such an amazing track. A Vesperia metal, any relation? Yeah. Tool is more of an alternative <laughs> band. Feisty Ferret, Tool is not metal. Jtroxel 278, Tool is pop metal. I just can't Ouch. win. Have you listened to the radio? <laughs> uh, <laughs> Lateralis. Uh, is one option. Yeah. Uh, what do you think? Is that the one, or or should we give Enema uh, some some love? It's so tough though. Yeah. I, I really like Lateralis a lot, and I do like Enema. Yeah. But you know, Lateralis, of course, with uh, you know Schism being like my favorite uh, favorite song, I got to go with Lateralis. Right. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll put them both up there, and we'll see where uh, everything lands. Uh, Lisa, does that satisfy the the tool hordes yeah. of which there are? Many. There are many. Uh -huh. I'm just trying to deal with how many people want to talk about the Deftones again because that comes up every show. <laughs> Please. And doesn't seem to ever resolve itself. Um, Maybe they're just their own branch. <laughs> <laughs> they're like a cell. Uh, what do we got here? Racer Rap. Racer Raps M. There are tons of instrumental metal albums that are not being recognized on the family tree. Okay, mm -hmm. uh, that's that's a bit of an outlier. Uh, but where are we? We we're, are we're, we are literally all over the place. We are yeah. all over the place. So I'm gonna, not unlike I'm, I'm actually going to like cowbell myself. You know what we're going to do? We're actually going to introduce the gong oh, for this no, moment because oh, no. I just have just run this shit aground. <laughs> Courtesy of uh, uh, Lockhorn's fan, thank you for sending in uh, our very own gong. It, uh, that is actually how big it is. It's not a Stonehenge moment. It's not supposed to be bigger. It's that size. Uh, okay, Lisa. Let's talk about some album art and what makes uh, this stuff cool to look at while I figure out what the people in the chat want for their last 10 minute push. Okay, so here we go. Let's, let's stop for a moment. If you want to see any other albums on this board, Get going, we got about 10 minutes left, so time is running out. If you think that there's an essential prog metal album uh, missing from the conversation, let's hear it. Okay, so let's talk about artwork here. Sure. Some great artwork in this genre. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what comes to mind? Is there anything unifying here? What comes to mind? Well, it's definitely one of those kind of like, with all the album art, it's a really kind of ones that makes you think. Mm -hmm. You know, it's one, it's one of those kind of, you know, it's genres where you take a look at the album artwork and then you just kind of think of like, what are they trying to mean with with the uh, you know what they're trying to portray with the album, right? Sure. It kind of giving yeah. you like an introduction of where it's kind of heading, right? Yep. Yep. With like kind of having a bit of like a 1984-esque vibe with Queens or with Queens, right? And then almost like with Opeth, kind of like wandering in a dark forest, could mean like uh, like the yep. sense of like the human psyche and like almost like kind of like a Dante's Inferno in a way, where it's sure. where it's about confusion and then kind of doing different layers and all that. But then you know it's and then it's also like a bit of a psychedelic vibe with mm -hmm. it, especially with the Macedon right. albums. I mean. You know, kind of fantastical. Fate's Warning as well was in there, and then yeah. of course you see Selma Sabotage, and then Queensryche and Dream Theater, and all these yeah. great prog yeah. metal yeah. albums, right? Again, I think going back to where we started, which is big appeal of this music uh, to us metalheads, is that there's uh, depth and richness. Mm -hmm. Yes. We've had an audio dropout. Oh. oh, my goodness. Okay, what should we do? Should we keep going? Uh, technical, or... technical difficulties. Technical difficulties, here we go. Bear with us. <laughs> Out. We're back. We're back. Oh, good. oh and we're back. You see how quick that was? Warts and all here on Lockhorns. Warts and all. In fact, we should maybe change the name to Warts and all. Okay, Lisa, <laughs> we've had a chat about the album art. 
We're winding down here. The uh, the minutes are ticking by. What's what's the plan? We're winding down in here, but the chat is like revving up out there. So okay. let's try and like power through some of these things. Okay, here we go. This band was bound to come up. Gojira. Thrashman says Gojira deserved to make the list. My personal choice would be La Fonce Sauvage because it has the most tracks I truly like. But in objective terms, uh, I might argue that Magma deserves a spot. Frank, sorry for the French uh, uh, pronunciation there. I'm not from Jean Pierre. Heavy Metal Heretic, Gojira, I can't choose an album, but they're clearly a prog metal giant. Mm -hmm. Andre Bork, I believe Gojira's early stuff is definitely prog. Newest two albums, less so. Uh, but um, from Mars, to serious, and I'm not even going to try and work that out. Uh, have the intricacy and atmosphere that you expect to see from prog heavyweights. Have the way of all flesh, of course. Yeah. Um, what do you think? I think yeah, way of all flesh. I think if we added like in terms of modern prog progressive metal, I think yep. out of all of Gojira's discography, I think that's the album that really kind of got them from being this kind of like unknown like hidden gem into this kind of juggernaut in the in the scene and with gojira it's like you know super rhythmical yeah. um you know all but also like a different kind of aesthetic that they bring is they also like bring like problems about the environment uh also with like hunting of whales you know they're very kind of like in uh, in your show the uh, extreme metal episode call them like eco metal i yeah. thought that was kind of like a kind of a cute spin on it <laughs> but um but yeah no i say like go go Jir, absolutely i mean they're a fantastic band and you know i was fortunate enough to meet them a couple years ago when they opened for slayer yeah and um they say never meet your idols unless they're gojira because those guys are yeah awesome great guys <laughs> uh one of the most important metal bands i think on the planet right now and we could all debate the degree to which their latest album in particular is sort of pushing in a progressive direction i might line just for argument's sake a little bit more on um from mars to sirius because um i think it was it was uh at much like say an images and words or an operation mind crime there was nothing else like it at the yeah. time uh it was a kind of a canary in the coal mine if yeah you will, but the, well the two tin plantier brothers so, i mean those guys are like probably the, one of the most insp inspirational musicians that are pretty much in the genre, like, yeah. like one of many, but yeah. like in terms of like uh, with Magma coming out recently yeah. and then the amount of uh, res like love it's getting, especially yeah. from a lot of different yeah. critics, like they've kind of f put their footprint in the genre and yeah, Gojira is definitely like, ha has like, is should be an essential, uh, in the essential albums for sure. Yeah. But it, it's funny though. Of all flesh, sorry, I have to actually say it to write <laughs> that good. out. It's very confusing. Yeah. Doesn't too wow. Doesn't really roll off the top. <laughs> okay, Lisa, what's yeah. next? Anything else before Lots. we close this up? Lots. I'm sorry. Okay. Like, okay. We don't get to go home yet. It's a it's frog stragglers. show. Hey. <laughs> uh, it's going to be a little long today, but uh, here's some stuff for you guys uh, to think about and decide whether it should go on the tree or not. Okay. Mm -hmm. Trans Girl with Attitude says, Voivod Nothing Face. It's weird as hell. It's epic science fiction themed metal, and it's fucking awesome. <laughs> <laughs> End of story. The Nightmare Rider uh, says, Symphony X, The Odyssey should be on the list, and epic in so many ways, including complexity, themes, and length. Justin Dipper says, Periphery needs to be discussed. Misha Mansour was the person to coin the term gent, and is arguably one of the most popular influential guitarists for current Prague. Here we go. Finally, some love for my boys in Enslaved. Hannah Kay says Isa should mm. be up there since it pushed slash merged black metal. It's a good point. We haven't had any talk about black metal yeah. here. They're the ones that really combine those two styles uh, effectively. Black metal into a very proggy direction and open the door for a heavier branch of progressive metal, keeping the scene fresh. Uh, and Super Joint says, I think we'll make a cause for Enslaved. They were in the pro Metal Evolution Prague episode. You got me. Uh, <laughs> me, I stopped listening after Eld. I only like the earlier stuff, so I have no idea. Fair enough. You're missing out, Super Joint. Mikhail Lopez, Enslaved Below the Lights. Prague Metal meets, uh, meets Black Metal. As we said before, the mixture is so good that even when they use flutes, you instantly <laughs> headbang like a motherfucker. Another contender for quarter of, the vo uh, quarter of the week. When you use flutes, they even make me headbang. Okay, back to Voivod. Yeah, absolutely nothing face, man. I mean, like that's like almost adding the thrash aesthetic, kind of like what, you know, definitely kind of bringing in the thrashy or elements from their like earlier discography, yep. but this is the album that kind of took them into a more progressive element sure. to, to it. So it yep. kind of like, as I said, like kind of bringing the, the bridge in the gap between like the 
prog rock and thrash, so it's kind of For adding sure. like both elements to it. Yeah. But yeah, I'd say out of out of all of Voivod's discography, this is the I don't this think is you get one. any dispute. There yeah. are obviously other fantastic records that have some of those elements. Uh, Dementor and Hatros, of course, comes to mind yeah. for me, but I think there's no dispute there that Nothing Face, hugely influential album, and obviously they rule because they're Canadian. But anyway, I digress. Yeah. Uh, what else was board, in there? Actually, yeah. uh, the Periphery? 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 As much as I like periphery, yes. and I do, and I do like the, uh, and I do like the gent movement, yep. I just think that periphery, I think, is maybe perhaps too new, too peripheral. <laughs> but like, that's all right. But like, I know, I think, like, you know, don't get me wrong. If we were to do this list, like, uh, within the next ten years, yeah, then we could see, like, with them, we'll definitely we'll see like periphery self-titled, especially yep. be be up there. Yeah, as and don't get me wrong, like, you know, it's it's hard to pick which album, right? Because sure. it's like you're splitting hairs with a lot of these bands. Sure. but I just think that bands like Periphery and Animals Leaders, the guys who are in the right. gen, gen yeah. scene, I yeah. think. They, time will tell. Time will tell. Yeah, I agree. I think we have to remember that this is about influence. And just because it's a great band, great record, doesn't mean it qualifies. It actually mm -hmm. has to have a lasting influence. Enslaved? What do you think about Enslaved? Great band. Yeah. I mean, um, is there an album for you? Mine is Vertebrae, to be honest with you. Okay. But, like, yeah. but, you know, it's, it's tough, though, because I, I really like Retier. But yeah. Retier is a little bit perhaps the new, one of the newer ones. Sure. But um, Issa is a great is a great one as well. But, Maybe, yeah. Maybe yeah. So, but like Enslaved, it's kind of funny though. Like a lot of um, black metal bands are kind of incorporating like a different atmosphere to their to their style in terms sure. of uh, in terms of a prog aspect, right? Yep. And I guess it's kind of like I would say a newer phenomenon with yep. black metal experimenting with progressive metal. Yep. So, yep. but Enslaved, yeah, fantastic band. Well, I mean, I think the uh, thing about Enslaved, if I may, Lisa, is that um, unlike Opeth, they didn't have one album that sort of tipped the scale. Yeah. It's been this very gradual, very steady, and not always is there a lot that distinguishes one album from the next, yeah. which you could argue is a strength or a weakness, but whether it's Issa, whether it's Below the Lights, whether it's on and on and on, Vertebrae, etc. I think they all have very strong prog metal elements, but yeah. definitely deserve to be there because they are the band that combined black metal and prog metal well. Mm -hmm. Yes. Sorry, I know you could talk Just about Slave for 44 minutes also. <laughs> so um, while I tabulate the uh, Devin Townsend votes, which so far are for every Devin Townsend <laughs> album, right? here is a curveball for you. Jamie Laszlo says, let me throw this one out there, Iron Maiden, Seventh Son of a Seventh Son. At the time mm. of its release, some people actually criticized it for being too proggy. Oliver Grunsai says, look no farther than Seventh Son of a Seventh Son for the perfect liaison of prog and metal. And Michael Cornett, I like Nothing Face as a choice on this list, but no Maiden? This list isn't complete. Maiden a band that probably could be on every list. Uh, Devin Townsend needs to be somewhere on there. Interesting, I mean. <laughs> yeah, I mean. I Maiden's think... hugely influenced by British prog bands. Yeah. Like Yes, et cetera. And in fact, you go back to the, even their earlier records, the songs on Killers and, and Number of the Beast and, and Peace of Mind that have very strong prog elements. But yeah. what do you think about that idea, Seventh Son? I, to be honest, I never really thought of it as being like, too proggy it, like it does have like prog elements in it but i still like you know with the tag of them being a part of the, like the new album scene yeah I, you know it's it's hard for me to kind of wrap my head of being like a in terms of like that being a prog metal thing in a way yeah um but you know i just kind of think it's more of a traditional angle but it's more like a experimenting a little bit yeah which is what a lot of yeah, those bands were doing i, I right? wouldn't call a prog metal album partly i mean they, they, <laughs> It doesn't have some of the hallmarks of the yeah. instrumentation of prog metal for me. I mean, they really aren't playing with time signatures the same way that a lot of the other bands no. are. Um, yes, they add a lot more keyboards, so maybe there's yeah. something there. But beyond that, there wasn't a lot of new instrumentation. doesn't mean it's not a great record. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I was at that show, Vancouver, uh, P&E. But um, anyway, I don't think it's a prog metal album. Yeah. Let's move on. Lisa, come on. we got to get to Devin Townsend. Otherwise, <laughs> we'll never get out of here. The yeah. world will tilt. What's fascinating to me this week is that people are being so nice like no one it's not like new metal where there's a lot of insults being right. hurled around there's no Jonathan Davis <laughs> well on frankly we're all just nerds that are just happy to be here so let's get into <laughs> yeah. it Devin Townsend here we go Miguel Riveros Devin Townsend's 
Ocean Machine, uh, Biomech pushed the genre to a different side, incorporating ambient music and hard rock. Diz2, Ocean Machine, and Accelerated Evolution song structures are far too basic to be true prog for me. Mm -hmm. uh, Julian Fitzgerald Ziltoid helped usher in the new age of prog metal along with Alien. Nothing before them sounds nearly like them. They also ushered in the new production standard for prog metal and warunki media. Devin is his own genre, not prog <laughs> metal. It's like he's too prog for prog. You can never be too That's proggy. <laughs> we did make a magnet uh, yeah. for um, Ocean Machine. Uh, yeah. Give me your thoughts. Another Canadian. Finally, we have like now the two biggest, arguably the two biggest Canadian like progressive acts for sure outside of Rush. Yeah. But anyways, <laughs> but yeah, Devin Towns and Ocean Machine. I mean, that's a fantastic, uh, like, fantastic album, and yeah. bless. You know, that was just kind of just showing kind of like the scratch on the surface of what Devin can really do in terms of, you know, bringing in different elements, right? And yeah. especially like with, you know, his later releases, <laughs> uh, you know, jump genre skipping is a big thing and then it's all inherently Devin, you know, right. essentially he is his own, almost like his own branch in a sense, right? Because sure. he's incorporating everything. But out of all of his discography, like Ocean Machine is like, I guess if you think of it like, uh, Devin Townsend's essential albums, you would probably be, you'd definitely be Ocean Machine. Okay, well we got him on yeah. the board, like we do almost every week, so <laughs> I think we can safely move on. Yeah, yeah. Not a lot of dispute, and I think some, maybe some, gen I mean there's probably a lot of albums out there, but yeah. uh, we're gonna go with Ocean Machine, uh, Lockhorns if you will. Lisa, we're gonna move on to Edge of Sanity. Yeah, so this mm. is, seems to be the last band that is The last band like, standing? The last band that people really, really want us to talk about. like a lot of people more than just one. Okay, so. here we go. Edge of Sanity Crimson, along with Opeth, uh, the band that took European death metal scene in the 90s to a pro to Prager territory. Prague Ludwig says Edge of Sanity Crimson has one 45 minutes concept song features both Ackerveld and Swano. Did Prague death before Opeth? What more can one say? And uh, Wessel Brokius is here again. Edge of Sanity Crimson the first and most successful marriage between extreme metal and prog before Opeth did it properly. Opinions? To be honest, I'm not too familiar with Edge of Sanity. Right. And that's like blasphemy, I know. But like, but um, you know, yep. I say like, as from what I've heard, yeah, there's definitely is progressive elements with Edge of Sanity. I just never, I didn't really think that people would bring them up so much in the, in the chat. But Fair enough. But to be to be quite fair, you know, just because I don't know a lot about a band's discography doesn't mean that they're not the essential, right? And plus, right. that's what we have the chat for. <laughs> well, that's a good point. I mean, the, yeah. there are some we could argue some sort of forgotten records. Yeah. In in this in this genre, I mean, you made a case for cynic focus, maybe similarly, kind of a bit ahead of its time. I mean, clearly, people are saying that Edge of Sanity was Opeth before Opeth was Opeth. Yeah. Uh, which is important to acknowledge, whether it was in, as influential influential as say a Blackwater Park uh, might be another conversation yeah. but um, but clearly an important record to a lot of people. Uh, Lisa? I have some very last comments about Devin Townsend for people who aren't quite sure about this decision we're making here. Michael Cornett says Devin Townsend has already progressed past progressive. <laughs> Mr. Uh, Nakunito says Devin is great and I love him, but his albums are not genre definers. He shouldn't be on the essential albums. Okay. And Warinky Media, Ocean Machine is a great album, but it was Devin at his most straight ahead songwriting. It was him coming out to the forefront as a singer songwriter. Yeah, but but then again, though, you someone can make the argument that Tool was not necessarily as technical, right? But you can still be pro you can still be in the prog family without being overly technical. It's more or less the sculpting of the song that right. really kind of makes it like prog in a sense, right? So I'd say like Ocean Machine for sure is definitely a prog album, and if you're kind of introducing somebody to Devin's discography, it's like, that's like a great starting point. And plus when even people were going for the Retinal Circus, or I think it was that, like one of his like fan voting um, mm -hmm. shows, nearly like half of the uh, of the set list was all from Ocean Machine. So you can yeah. tell the impact it's had on a lot of fans within the progressive Well, metal. I would argue we pulled Devin Townsend off and we've got a bigger battle to fight. So sometimes you gotta pick your battle. Speaking yeah. of picking battles, Lisa? We need to get this down to 10, <laughs> okay, oh, okay. And, we, and we need to do it faster than most prog albums. Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. Also, some very uh, sharp-eyed people on the chat have noticed that there's a magnet we printed that hasn't come up yet. Is it this one? No. 
Is it this one? Yes. <laughs> so I think this is just going to be like a contender. I should go destroy, yeah. erase, and prove. Just because people are yelling at me in all caps about this one. And then you guys, you got to pick your top 10. Okay. Yeah. Let's do this quickly. Time is tight. Yeah. Uh, obviously, Queen, I think this is a no brainer. Queen's Rank Stays, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think we're going to have to go with uh, images and words. Yeah. I'm going to pull rank here. Uh, I think we're probably going to have to go... <laughs> uh, no. I'll give you Leviathan, buddy. Thanks, bud. Uh, thanks, for, uh, <laughs> thanks for coming out. Uh, uh, I think we got to have Blackwater Park. It's essential. No question. I think we've got to have Cynic Focus. Where does that leave us? That leaves us with... Um, I would and argue... And and I would sugar. argue that you've probably got to have colors. Yep. From between the buried and me, so where does that give us? That's one. So there they are here. Yep. One, two, three, four, five, six. six. Yep. For sure. What else do we have? Do we give it to? We give it to Voivod. Nothing face. Yeah, Voivod for sure. And then, and then, how about Lateralis? Lateralis, yeah. So that and gives us eight. So Mashuga's come come up late. Devin Townsend's come up late. So we got two more spots to fill. What do what? we? What do we do? We do Meshuga, we do Devin Townsend, Gojira, Enslaved. Oh, enslaved yeah. Colors is on there, right? Yeah, Colors, Colors is, is on, on there, there. yeah. Okay. I'd say, I'd say um, in terms of all, all four bands we just mentioned, um, I'd say if we did, tr like, as much as I like Enslaved, I think that Gojira, Meshuga, and Devin have, have made more of an impact in terms of the prog metal scene, even though I do like okay. Enslaved a lot. So I say we drop man, Enslaved. Man, man, you gotta have, uh, you, I mean, let's and, step back, people. You gotta have Meshuggah. <laughs> Where else are you gonna put them? Yeah. They basically invented a genre. So we have it down to essentially We now, got nine. We so got we one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Wait a second. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, wait a second. One, two, three, four. No, you, you counted that twice. Did I? Yeah. Yes. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. We've got one more left. So it's between Gojira and Devin Townsend. <laughs> I, and oh, I would no. argue Enslaved deserves a run because uh, it's black metal. They're the only band that has combined black metal but... and prog. Are they influential enough? They've been around man. a lot longer than Gojira. That's true. I mean, oh man, that's that's bloody tough. I think we got to give it to Devin. Yeah, let's give it to Devin. He's Canadian boy. Come on, we got to we got to give it show to him some love. Tough one. Maybe should have been top twenty. Yeah. No, we actually that's a that's another discussion, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Because it's it's hard to pick like the top ten though, because like one could argue that each album was super influential in its own way, and now we're just kind of splitting hairs among splitting hairs essentially, right? right? So, but you know. I of think course, it's pretty solid. and like, and yeah, and then Mashuga bringing in the heavy rhythm aspect to it, uh, plus Thomas yep. Hake introducing yep. in a whole other style of drumming. I mean, yeah, it's like with any one of these, it's tough, man. This is this is a tough episode, man. <laughs> How are we doing? How are the hordes? <laughs> the hordes are somewhat appeased for now. I have two last comments. Okay. Uh, for this week, uh, one of them is from Shark Crusher Thirteen. Who says, is it just me, or does the Focus album art look like an alien vagina? <laughs> I think the answer is yes, it and does. And I, I read that Paul out, made a joke so about that, you wouldn't have way. to say that. There's an, there's an, actual, <laughs> there's an actual interview that Paul made a joke that, like, Cynic's Focus is the vagina, and then Trace and is kind of like the, the other bits. The other bits. <laughs> to the and, magic. And? One of our guys in the chat, his name was uh, Warunki Media. Yeah. Or Warunki Media. If you want to chat more prog metal, add yourselves to the page on Facebook, West Coast Prog Brigade. There you go. Keep it going. Carry on. More words. Mm -hmm. I think we're good. There you go. The top 10 essential prog metal albums as determined by us as well as you. Good job, Dylan. <laughs> Thanks for being on the show. Thanks for allowing me. Lisa, Daniel, Craig, Andrew, and guest Frank, thank you for joining us. Help me out here, Lisa. I think we're, mi we're skipping next week. Correct? We are on hiatus. We have to recover from all of this. <laughs> and uh, we'll see you again soon. Thank you for joining us on Lockhorns. That was a fun one. We'll be back sooner than later. Bye for now. <laughs>